adjournment uh, uh, time allotted to address a few concerns that have, uh, I've had for a long time, and uh, they are, you know, challenged in this chamber almost every day, particularly by the members of the Australian Greens. And I wanted to put on the uh, record something which you'd be very familiar with, uh, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, and that is the contribution of the mining sector to the Australian economy. And the contribution of the mining sector, in particular in respect to uh, monetary amounts and the contribution to the uh, employment in this country. So we do know from our good friends at the Parliamentary Library that the uh, iron ore and contraprates exports were worth $102.7 billion, uh, $102 billion in 2019-20 and accounted for 26.9 per cent of the total value of Australia's merchandise exports. We know that, once again, from the information from our good friends at the Parliamentary Library, the coal exports were worth uh, $54.6 billion in 2019-20, which accounted for 14.3 per cent of the total value of merchandise exports. And we know that natural gas exports were worth $47.5 billion, which accounted for 12.4 per cent of the total value of merchandise exports. And those things cumulatively add up to a significant chunk of the nation's exports and earnings. Now we know from, uh, from the, uh, the parliamentary library, because uh, you asked the question and they diligently provide the answer, that there are significant amounts of people employed in each one of those sectors. And uh, those, uh, those discrete numbers uh, add up to really uh, high, um, high employment figures right around the country because as the mining sector's changed and it's become fly in, fly out or drive in, drive out, people don't actually live around the Surat Basin or the Pilbara or the other areas of exploration uh, of gas. So we know that each and every electorate in this country comprises people who either through mining or uh, energy or technological services to the mining industry, earn their bread and butter, feed their families, educate their children, pay their mortgages through that connection with the very vital uh, mining sector. And this is not rocket science. But when I see people say, uh, dirty coal, let's get rid of coal, or you know, gas is too expensive, or gas is burning the planet, I don't really understand how those people who advocate those positions, what they're saying to the people in the sector. In the absence of any grand plan, I think you're threatening their employment opportunities. I think you're threatening their livelihoods, and they will take the appropriate action. They will take the appropriate action. They won't vote for you. So, you know, it's fine to be a member of the Greens political party because I'm certain that their motto should be, and to channel Whitlam's 1967 speech, Certainly the impotent are pure. You can be ideologically pure, but you'll never have to make a decision. You'll never have to have the, the, you know, the owner of government, or the honest uh, uh, approach to government where you have to make difficult decisions. You can be in opposition forever, and I condemn them or actually compliment them for their, their strident advocacy of never to be in government, because they should never be allowed anywhere near the wheels of government. So certainly they're, uh, they're ideologically will continue to make them impotent. But we've got to get to a situation in Australia where it's not adversarial, save the planet, ditch the worker. You know, if, if the market is what I believe it is, a successful uh, capitalist market will make prudent decisions based on investment, on technology, on what's coming up the pipeline. And look, you know, the argument's fairly clear with ageing power uh, infrastructure that, you know, why would you invest in an ageing power plant powered by coal if you can get away with uh, a switch on, switch off gas opportunity and it's dearer? Well, someone's got to pay for that. Uh, we know that with renewable technology, you know, when the wind stops blowing and the sun stops shining, you've got to crank something up quickly. Coal's probably a bit too slow for that. The batteries are not there yet, but gas is. Gas is. Turn it on, turn it off. And it's significantly more expensive than coal. So I accept that the market will make decisions like that. 
But we can't tell people engaged in industries which are vital to Australia's economic prosperity that we don't care about them, that we don't value their contribution. If we do tell people that, then we're never going to get elected. The Labor Party is never going to get elected. We need to have a strategy for the people in the Hunter Valley, the Surat Basin and the Pilbara. Because those people don't actually live in those areas, they live all over Australia. And if we're going to be a party which is closer to the Greens than I would like, I want it on the record here tonight that I don't support that. I support climate change. I'm not a denier. But I'm not about throwing out a livelihood which people have worked hard in, fed families in, earned good money in, contributed well to the economy because of some uh, Kyoto Protocol or whatever. This has got to be pragmatically and carefully worked through. And I, for one, Al, can be labelled a heretic on my side. I'm not really fussed about that. But I'm not going to endure in this place notices of motion calling on climate emergencies which threaten the livelihoods of 650,000 Australians involved in mining and mining services in this country. I'm not going to stand by and, and, and just let that go through to the keeper. I'm going to oppose it. I think you can do a number of things very well in this country. And you can manage your attitude towards climate change and you can manage your income and your attitude towards mining and mining services. Because we've done it for a century or more. No one wants to destroy the environment. No one. But we do have to have an economic prosperity. I think even I agreed with Senator, Senator Roberts, if you haven't got an economic uh, system that delivers prosperity, you're not prosperity you're not in a position to make any decision. You're usually begging. So we are prosperous. We are smart. The chief scientist is uh, you know, on the ball. He, he recommends a way forward. Uh, other people are saying, no, no, it's all got to be one way. Well, it hasn't all got to be one way. Government is really difficult. And for those who want to be ideologically pure, certainly don't go to government. But there is tough decisions in this space that should and can be made. And I, for one, wanted to, on the record here that whilst I'm not a climate change denier, I'm certainly not walking away from the mining industry. I think it's delivered very well for this country. It's underpinned the prosperity of, uh, of regions and states and the entire country. And um, every time I see one of these notice of motions encouraging us to throw people under a bus, I get pretty angry about that. So I wanted to take that uh, few minutes tonight to, to do that. And I also want to put on the record that I try and actually drill down. So I know I come from the state with the highest level of renewable energy, solar, wind and the like, solar on the roof. But I also know this, I just built a new house. And it's six grand I can put you know, a respectful amount of kilowatts on the roof and uh, diminish my bill. But the pensioner in my street hasn't got the $3,000 or $6,000 to do that. And they're paying a higher infrastructure charge. And the government is spending a billion dollars a year subsidising solar, which is wonderful. But what about the people who can't afford those panels? What about the people who are paying slightly higher, or not slightly high, uh, infrastructure charges because they have no option? You know, I, I've got an, an app on my phone. My house actually costs three dollars fifty a day to run. It's brand new. It's brand new. It's insulated. It's well built. It's the latest green u uh, design. And it costs three or four dollars a day. There are pensioners in my street who are paying much more than that because their houses are not well built. They're not built for the climate. They're not insulated. And yet we go out and subsidise wealthy people like myself to put solar on the roof. You know, so I, I, I drill down into this and I get quite angry at times that you know, we're all wedded to saving the planet. But there seems to be some pretty obvious gaps in all of this. What are we going to do with the workers in sections that people threaten? Because threatening people will guarantee one reaction, they won't vote for you. So if you're not clear, if you're not clear on your strategy forward, I suggest you don't advocate it. And if you have a sway strategy forward, it's got to include a transition plan. And I hear no transition plan. I just say, oh, you know, coal is going to disappear. Well, a lot of crap, it's $47 billion last year, exports. There's a million tonnes goes out on, on trains out of Port Waratah. You know, there are people repairing those trains. So in the final few seconds, I wanted this on the record because I am pragmatic about this space. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
Online dating apps have changed how an entire generation meets and how they connect with each other. Dating apps like Tinder and Bumble have become part of young people's lives. They allow them to meet people in their area who share their interests in a way that is convenient, accessible and affordable. These platforms have had a transformative impact on our lives. And for the most part, this transformation has been emphatically positive. But like most platforms, they also impose harms on the community. Those harms have taken time to become obvious, and it is taking longer for regulators and law enforcement agencies to adapt to them. Dating apps have also proven to be a useful mean for predators to target young people and to commit a range of offences known as technology-facilitated sexual violence. A number of recent cases demonstrate what is meant by this. The most shocking is that of a 13-year-old girl who was in the care of the South Australian Minister for Child Protection. This girl was a user of the MyLol dating app, which is aimed at teens, and was targeted by a 35-year-old pedophile. She was impregnated and subsequently went, underwent a termination. Despite the heinous offence committed against someone in the state's care, the minister was not even aware of the case until a guilty verdict was returned in August this year. I contacted the minister three months ago seeking information about what action she would be taking to protect other minors in the state's care, and incredibly, this correspondence has gone unanswered. Another case relates to a 56-year-old man whose body was found in February this year. The body was found bound and abandoned in bushland near Batemans Bay. Police have alleged that the man arranged a meeting with a 17-year-old through the Grindr app. Whilst the circumstances remain unclear, um, but the 17-year-old along with two others have been charged with the man's murder. A third case relates to a Melbourne man known as the Tinder Rapist. This man used Tinder and other apps to arrange meetings with his victims before committing acts of sexual violence against them. Incredibly, the man continued using Tinder even after he was charged with sexual assault. He was able to set up multiple accounts using fake names and continued to try and lure women. The man subsequently pleaded guilty and received a sentence of 14 years and nine months. He has shown no remorse for his actions or for the trauma he caused his victims. And tragically, one of his victims took her own life before the man was sentenced. The judge presiding over the case said the online world, and I'll quote, provides a fertile landscape where predators can roam, end of quote. These cases demonstrate the truth of that claim. The key point here is that the apps don't recognise they have any duty of care to protect their users from predators. No duty of care. An investigation by ABC's Four Corners and Hack programs revealed that apps like Tinder often fail to act on user complaints. When complaints are made, users often receive little more than an automated response. It is not clear if the platforms actively investigate complaints, whether they take action to block users who are accused of wrongdoing, or even whether they report wrongdoing to police or other agencies. The investigation also revealed that police and other agencies struggle to make contact with these apps in the course of an investigation, which is simply unacceptable. It could be argued that such apps even facilitate predatory behaviour, with lax registration requirements and features like Tinder's unmatch facility, which erases the message history between users, completely erases the history. Effectively, a predator can register on Tinder with nothing more than an email address and a burner phone. Once they have committed an offence, they can unmatch with the victim and it becomes virtually impossible for police to trace the offender. In Australia, every business providing financial services is required to comply with know your customer obligations. 
Platforms like Tinder should be subject to similar obligations so that perpetrators can be easily identified when an offence is committed. Every platform should also offer a simple way for law enforcement agencies to contact them and access information about users, including their message histories. Simply publicising a basic level of cooperation could be enough to deter many predators. Last month, the Australian Institute of Criminology published a report into dating apps and violent offending. Although dating apps only facilitate a small proportion of sexual assaults, it is clear that users of these apps have a greater risk of victimisation than non-users. That report noted research which found that around half of all dating app users had experienced some form of harassment. Over half. And such experiences were even more common against LGBTQ plus users. It is not clear if the app developers are aware of these experiences, and if they are, it does not appear they are taking action to clean up the behaviours of users. Few apps publish safety guidelines or provide users with information about what constitutes an offence and how they can take action when an offence is actually committed. A user's only recourse is to report one wrongdoing in the app and hopefully someone actually sees or acts upon the report. As the law currently stands, there is no legal obligation for these apps to remove or block sexual or violent offenders from using these platforms. The criminal history of users is not screened, and this enables predators and very much needs to change. The businesses which develop and profit from these apps need to be accountable. Their products have facilitated a great number of relationships, friendships and marriages, and developers should rightly feel proud of the good they have achieved. But, and a big but, they should all be also be held accountable for the harms which they have indirectly facilitated. It is unfortunate the businesses have not been proactive in providing greater protections for their users. It is because of this failure that the government needs to step in and protect the community. A year ago, the Minister for Communications announced the government would legislate a new online safety act that would help to deliver the protections the community expects. The minister said, and I'll quote, the internet offers significant economic and social benefits but these benefits will only be fully realised if Australians can engage confidently and safely in the online world." End of quote. Now, I agree with those comments entirely. As part of the announcement, the government circulated a consultation paper at the end of last year, which included a proposal for basic online safety. Now, these will provide minimum standards for apps and platforms to meet. Although I was unsure whether these expectations would be enough to protect users, I felt it was very much a good start. Incredibly, there has been no action since the consultation closed in February. Admittedly, the pandemic has made it more difficult to consult and develop policy, but it also has also forced more people online more of the time. There is even greater need for these protections to be developed and legislated in the current environment. I urge the government to recognise online safety as a matter of urgency and a legislative priority. And I ask the Minister to commit to introducing legislation to this effect in the first sitting of 2021. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.